Thank you all so much to everyone for joining us and welcome to today's FP Forum. For those who have never been here before, for those who only found out about the free press today, welcome. This is our regular subscriber only event series where you get to meet our staff, where you get to meet our writers, editors, guest columnists, inside sources, and other special guests, including the two incredible women that are here joining us today. Typically, we do these every other Wednesday, but tonight we're thrilled to be hosting a very special event for all of you in light of the important story that we published today by Jamie Reed. Jamie started working as a case manager at the Washington University Transgender Center at St. Louis Children's Hospital a little more than four years ago. She joined, as she writes, because she believed that the work she was doing was saving vulnerable children who had gender dysphoria. But as she writes today in her powerful essay, what she witnessed was morally and medically appalling, so much so that she went to the Missouri Attorney General. Here also with us tonight is the incomparable Emily Yaffe, an associate editor at the Free Press and the editor of this incredible piece. Emily has written for The Atlantic. For many years, she wrote the Dear Prudence advice column at Slate Magazine, and she's played a really crucial behind the scenes role at bringing you so much of the reporting, especially the investigative reporting that we've done. Last but not least, we have Bernadette Broyles. Broyles is Jamie's lawyer, and she's also the president and general counsel at the Child and Parental Rights Campaign. Her advocacy is focused on student privacy, on parental rights, Title and on Title IX protection cases, which is an issue that Emily Afi has written a lot about herself. Thank you all so much for joining us. The pleasure to be here. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Um, so basically, here's how it's going to work. Um, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Emily, um, and she's going to talk to Jamie and Bernadette for the next half hour, maybe 40 minutes. As always, uh, we want to hear from you. So please use the Q&A function to give us your best questions, and we'll get to as many of them as possible. Emily, over to you. Great. Thanks. So, Jamie Reed, how was your day? It was actually pretty normal. I did my work. I work in hematology oncology now, and I work on bone marrow transplant studies. And I, I tried to focus on my day-to-day -day work. Um, I'm not on a lot of social media. So I had a couple people texting me sometimes saying, Hey, oh my gosh, this just happened. Um, but it, it was, it was another day. Well, you, you still work at Washington university. The complex where the uh, transgender center is. Was there any blowback from within your workplace? No, it was absolutely quiet from my from from anyone above me. I am not sure if anyone on my new team um, is going to be aware tomorrow of what happened, but um, I work from home um, often on days like today, and I, I just did a lot of work. Okay. So before we talk about the bomb you exploded and the political reaction, et cetera, um, let's review why you're here, what happened. You, how did you get to the transgender clinic? What did you think and hope you would be doing? And when did you start realizing, as you say in the piece, you were participating in a project that was harming children? So I have actually worked at WashU for um, close to almost eight years, I believe now. I worked with youth who are HIV positive. So I worked on a special project that had young adults and a few teens who um, found themselves HIV positive at a young age. So I worked with this younger cohort. I was their case manager. I helped them with their medications, their appointments. And what I found was a number of them were trans, gender diverse, and it started to become a passion of mine. And I started working really hard on learning how to serve that community. So how name changes work, how gender markers work, and what special needs that community needed, faced, and um, needed from case management services. So when the position opened at the Pediatric Transgender Center, I immediately applied and um, 
was asked to join the center. What happened? What did things make sense at the beginning or from the beginning, you started to have doubts about what was going on? Things made sense, but at the very beginning, I immediately could see that there was leadership and procedural holes, that there were a lot of gaps. So in medicine, most places will have standard operating procedures, they'll have policies, they'll have really written guidelines for how uh, a center or a clinic is going to function. And none of those existed for this center. There was very little in terms of patient education material. There was very little in terms of any preparatory work that looked like even occurred before it opened. And they were already opened a year out. I was actually replacing um, a case manager that they had had in 2017. So right away, I thought there, there's just a lot not here um, prepared for this patient population. Which, and, and let's just say these, these kids were how old? Um, and what was the uh, gender makeup, boys, girls coming in saying, I'm in the wrong body. I want to change sex. So initially, um, the center served patients there really is no bottom age and went all the way up to 26. But initially, I probably did about 10 intakes in a month. And these would be often kids who had more longstanding, clear gender issues from early childhood, things that had been clearly there for years and years and years before they were even referred or coming to a specialty center like a gender care center. And the mix was a lot more even keel. It was more um, boy-girl ratio was a a lot more, um, you know, if not evenly matched. um, There was not this huge gap that I ended up starting to see as time went on. And and the gap was um, these teenage girls. Yeah, it was, it became very suddenly declaring to their families. I'm, I'm a boy and I want to. It was about 70, 30. So 70% um, of who we were seeing were natal girls. Okay. Let me just bring in Bernadette here. Um, Bernadette, welcome. Uh, Tell us about your firm. Uh, what kind of advocacy you um, participate in and how you and Jamie came together. Sure. So the Child and Parental Rights Campaign, we're a public interest nonprofit law firm. We're a national. We have attorneys in in several different states. And we're, we're really one issue. Our focus has been protecting children's health and defending parents' rights, parental rights, against government officials, either whether it's Child Protective Services or more more often schools, who are in some way infringing on the rights of parents to be able to make basic um, medical, mental health care decisions for their child, or deciding how to raise their child, and are making basic decisions for their child's well-being. And so, you, you know, you might find it surprising, but it's not. How often at this point school systems um, are undermining the decision making of parents, and so when you when we heard about you know even a medical clinic beginning to undermine parents' abilities to to give full and and free and informed consent, it kind of was falling along with the pattern of what we were seeing in other areas. Um, how Jamie we, we came across Jamie and an ally of ours. We we network with others um, in different modalities. And an ally of ours brought her to our attention and um, just realizing that we had the legal capacity to be able to, to advise her and represent her and, and we <coughs> understood the, the area of this, this particular um, challenge that are facing, you know, children and parents. So let's get uh, down to the kind of anecdotes that so shocked people who read this story. Um, Jamie, I'd love to have you tell briefly uh, a couple of stories, either 
from the piece, or there's an affidavit today we'll we'll talk about from the Missouri Attorney General um, telling even more of the stories that you had. M- maybe you can uh, again. We there's so many stories we want to get to them. Yeah. So briefly, maybe to, l- let me let me point out a couple. One was in the affidavit that we didn't have in our piece about um, t- two young children coming in wanting to transition. Um, Tell about the child who said, I don't know if it's he or she was blind. And then tell about the, um, the young man who was in lockdown for um, abusing animals. Sure. Um, Emily, I think I want to first just note that one of the challenges in for me, ethically and morally and working in the center is it kept feeling like we would almost set a red line. Like there's no way they could go past this, right? There's like no way we're going to do this next case. And then the next thing you know, we're giving that next patient hormones too. It just kept feeling like the extremeness just could not, there was no end in sight to how extreme this was going to get. Let Um, let me just, um, I think most of our listeners have read the story, but just in context, you write about children who have multiple um, mental health problems. Many come from traumatic uh, childhoods. They, They suddenly often realize I'm transgender. And the crux of the story is that they come in, announce that, and the physicians you work with accept that and start them on life altering drugs. We'll talk in a minute about how life altering those are, but give us these, um, the, the examples of yeah. children you thought should never be uh, medicated for gender. So the, the first case that you brought up is the, the young person, natal girl um, who who we had started on testosterone, who, who was indicating that they believed that they could no longer see, that they had, their vision was so, that they had this disability with their vision that they, they got to the point where they were walking with a cane when they came to clinic. And they were sent to uh, ophthalmology. They were sent to have all of the vision screenings done and everything that screened. How, how old was this girl? I believe 15, maybe 16. And everything came back that they, they could see perfectly fine. So this would have been an example of what in medicine we would call a somatization disorder, a conversion disorder. And this was not the only patient with a conversion disorder. Conversion disorders and these type of conditions have elements of social contagion, they're often found in girls. They're often found in adolescent girls. And they demonstrate a real underlying mental health need. This is one of the most so these difficult. Are, these are young girls who think something is medically wrong, with, wrong them. with them. And they have the, right. And they have symptoms that they that they that are real to them. And I I never want to say that these are not real to them. I do believe that that patient did not believe that they could see the same way that many of the the girls came in that had tick disorders, that they believe they had Tourette's. They believe that they were having seizures. They were falling down in class. They would, they would claim that their legs could no longer support them. Um, And they really had a really severe mental health condition. Somatization disorders are so severe and require so much work and treatment. There is absolutely no way that these patients were in the right mental place to be able to make any long-term decisions about their health, let alone um, decisions about gender transitioning as a child. And we were beginning to see more and more cases of this. So this is one of those other social contagion elements. And then the patient that you talked about, the, the boy who came to us at first when they were 17, 
the minute that this case came to us, I honestly believed that this center would not touch this patient and would recognize that this patient was well outside of their scope, that this patient was in a locked down residential facility in the foster care system, had horrible trauma history, abuse history, and had a history of sexually abusing animals. And when they first came to us, I worked with their case manager and their case manager told me that not only did they not have any real regret, but they had told everyone on staff that they would reoffend as soon as they were released from the facility. They were violent. They were they were having the police this call boy, on when them. you say they it's this, this boy, boy this was 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 still up until the point when we were prescribing hormones um was attacking the staff in the the facility i i could not see that we would ever believe that we would be be doing anything with this patient and yet our in in the house internal psychologists did sessions and wrote a letter of support and when that letter of support was sent over to the endocrinologists, um, myself and another staff member read it, and we could not believe the letter of support. It was um, riddled with inaccuracies. This this youth was claiming that they had a picture perfect family that they were baking cookies with mom, and this and that's how they you know had feelings about their it's, gender. So the the point is. Um, as you make in the piece and in an aff affidavit with the attorney general, anyone who came through the door got powerful cross-sex hormones, boys got estrogen, girls got testosterone, uh, and their lives were permanently altered. Absolutely. And okay. we gave that person hormones. Okay. Let's... Um, since the piece was published in the free press at six this morning, a lot has happened today. Um, so uh, first of all, Republican Senator Josh Hawley, uh, very early in the morning after the publication, announced he's launching an investigation of the clinic. Um, and uh, the attorney general, who you already had come to, uh, announced he is launching on kids. Can you talk about this investigation? What is uh, going to happen? What you hope happens? And I'll go ahead and jump in just real quickly, Jamie. <clears throat> so Jamie has uh, been a, has afforded of herself the protections that are under Missouri law, under your whistle the whistleblower statute. So by virtue of being someone in healthcare who who is observing treatments that are that is harming. Um, to patients, treatments that potentially are um, misappropriating state funds, being paid for things that should not be done, et cetera. Um, she appropriately, after trying to make changes, get changes to happen internally that were not be, that they just were not going to, you know, honor her, her concerns. Um, she appropriately made a report, a complaint to the, uh, to the right governing official. And under Missouri law, that's the attorney general. The attorney general's office is, is the office that has the authority to protect patients and to do these kinds of investigations. And as the, the AG's release indicated, she did that about two weeks ago. And so in truth, so they're now um, have publicly stated that they are uh, commencing an investigation into the practices of the center but also they've there are other agencies who are implicated by the actions in this clinic so the medical licensing board and also the department of social services are also going to be launching their own investigations because of the potential for medicaid fraud and of, and of course for the um what appears to be unethical treatments and and medical judgments by the by the medical professionals um, and at that point, you know, Jamie, she, she, you know, she 
she did what a good citizen does and a good healthcare professional does, should do. It's now in the, the hands of the attorney general. As far as uh, United States Senator Hawley, he has indicated that he wants, his office is going to be conducting an investigation, which almost certainly means, you know, demanding records because there are, there are federal funds that are used to pay for, that were used to pay for some of these patients. So it, it frankly, to me, it makes sense. I think it's appropriate for uh, a federal government official to be asking questions about the propriety of the treatments, were they harmful? And then even, even after they started and patients started to exhibit negative outcomes, their mental health worsened yes, rather yes. than getting better. I mean, the whole, the whole alleged purpose for the treatments was to treat their mental health. However, as Jamie indicated to you all, for so many of the patients, their mental health actually got worse, or there were there were physiological, um, you know, manifestations of harm to them: cholesterol going up, blood pressure, renal, um, you know, liver issues. So at some point, there'll be the question of, "Wow, should that treatment have stopped?" But apparently, they did it, and so they continued to bill both Medicaid and the state. So all of these things, it's just. It's just flat out, you know, government doing its job to be these various different investigations to be going forward. The there is a lot of outrage on Twitter um, from the attorney general of Missouri, senator from Missouri and lots of other people. Almost all of it was from people on the right. There were I. I was looking at Twitter all day. I, I don't think I saw anyone who's, who said, I'm a Democrat. What What is happening here? This has to stop. As you say in the piece, Jamie, this, this fight has become part of the culture war. You are, um, a, you, you describe yourself as a queer woman to the left of Bernie Sanders. So you've got quite conservative Republicans rushing in to champion, champion this cause. How do you feel about that? And do you, uh, how do you feel about the lack of concern or voicing any outrage um, from the people you are politically aligned with? Ooh, the second part is, it's a tough question. Um, I live in a red state. I, there's no getting around that. I live in the state of Missouri and I live in a city and I live in a state that is very red. So I have to follow the correct uh, procedures and the laws and how to bring the proper attention and hopefully um, and hopeful oversight and the I, I just had to go to who is there. And I live in a state where the people who are in these offices are um, Republicans. And I believe that they are going to do their job. And I hope that they do their job um, correctly. And I hope that they can do just that. Um, and when they do their job correctly, what happens to the transgender center you used to work at? I do not believe it can continue to function as, as you a want center. to close down. I believe it's the only way to actually stop hurting more kids. Um, okay. And, and as far as expanding the concern about these kids. So the, so the first step that I believe, um, I hope that that Democrats and others in this state will do is actually look at the evidence and look at the charts and look at what comes out of this investigation. So every case that I talk about has a medical chart right there waiting for somebody to pull it and to just look at the information. It is sitting there. But I I think part of what has what I've struggled with too is that I have watched providers in the center that I work with go to my state's capital and blatantly lie to the the legislators. They specifically stated that there was no surgical referrals ever occurring, 
that surgery wasn't for happening minors. in minors for yeah. minors. Um, things that I, we knew when we watched them testify was just not true. And I think that it's difficult for Democrats or Republicans to really know what's going on when places in these centers are willing to not tell the truth. Okay. Well, you know, and uh, Emily, if I can chime in as well, this is, this is a multi-agency response to what Jamie has exposed. So we have the um, director of Department of Social Services, Robert Cadell. That's a, that's a non-political job. That, that's just, that's a career, you know, executive agency job that's tasked with protecting the public. Um, you have, you know, Sheila Stahl on the director of the Division of Professional Registration. Again, that's a non-political job. Um, we've, we have simply got to get past the partisanship for this. Our kids are not Democrats or Republicans. Thank you, Bernadette. Yes. You know, seriously. And it, they require of us to get past these, these political divisions for the sake of their, for their, of their future and our future. And so, you know, these are the officials that are tasked with protecting them, period. I don't, I don't know what their politics is. It frankly should not matter to us. It, the facts should be what matter to us. Go ahead, Jamie. Well, the hospital administrators and the people that oversee these hospitals are also tasked with making sure that these kids are not being hurt. And one of the things that was so challenging over and over again is that we kept trying to raise this. I rose, I, I brought this to the attention of the people that were my supervisors just over and over and over again. It was like, can somebody please look at this? This is, this is what's going on. And one of the real breakdowns in this is that there were so many mid-level people who could have just actually stopped and tried to pay attention. And that's where I think part of that pain is there too, is that the hospitals, these hospitals that are running these centers, it's their mission to support kids and to take care of kids and to take care of families. And by turning a blind eye to what's happening in these centers, they're, they're also failing at their mission. I want to ask you about why that was, but let, let me just summarize quickly. Since you say 70% of the patients um, in the years you worked there were, were uh, teenage girls who had not from childhood said, I'm a boy, who very suddenly came in, said, I'm a boy. They got in, as you write, a meeting, one meeting with a therapist, one meeting with an endocrinologist. They walk out with testosterone and as you describe what happens within a few months to a teenage girl, she starts growing a beard. Her voice the drops. Voice this is going to drop. Permanent. Fat's um, going to start redistributing and moving, and you're going to have clitoral growth that's going to turn your your body into a body that has a micro phallus, a, a micro phallus, and you also are going to have your your labs are going to start looking like garbage like you could You're, watch you mean the, the lab work on the okay the lab so, work okay uh several um subscribers Jody Chambers David Abood uh among them are asking what in the world is going on here where are the parents why are parents allowing this to happen to their daughters? And the other question is, uh, doctors take an oath to do no harm. Um, you describe these, these girls, this is not long uh, existing dysphoria. They seem to have many uh, social contagion like illnesses. Why is a whole hospital system saying we want to do this to girls? And why are parents going along? So. A lot of the parents trust the medical establishment. They came to a prestigious regional children's hospital that puts itself out there as um, as being the best at, at care. 
I will be honest with you. If one of my kids gets hurt and we need to go get stitches, I'm going to Children's Hospital. I'm the, it is the regional epicenter for good quality care. And the parents trusted that the doctors were doing the assessments and the and the doctors weren't doing the assessments because the doctors wanted the mental health providers to do the assessments, but the mental health providers aren't really doing the assessments either. And it's this just loop of nobody wants to actually take the responsibility for the real decision-making that needs to happen. And so it lands in the lap of a child. But the parents really, a lot of the parents really were trusting, but also we really lied to them all the time. We maligned parents who didn't want to go along. We told them that they were going to hurt their kids. We told them that, you know, there was one doctor who's no longer there, but who would use those phrases. You know, you can either have a living daughter or dead son or these, and they'd say this in front so of the kids. If you had a, a, if you had a teenage girl there, they would say, if you don't transition this girl, you'll have a dead daughter. Yeah. If you transition this girl, you'll have a live son. That Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and, and I noted that you said this conversation would happen in front of the child. Almost the entire, yes, the entire medical, these entire visits would happen in front of the kids. So they would Which raise also, the possibility of uh, the child would commit suicide in front of the child. There was one provider who would do that. Yes. But you also set up the parents you're putting these parents in a non-winning situation. You're putting their seriously distressed child in front of them, the child who believes that if they could have just had this medication, this, these hormones last week, that their entire world would now be rainbows and glitter. And you're putting that kid in front of the parent and the parent is then put on the spot and the parent is who's going to have to go home with the kid at the end of the day. So none of the way that the system worked was actually looking out for how do we in how do we build this family up and keep them intact and whole? How do we empower the parents to be parents and to be able to say no? And the thing that really irritated me often is when the parents would say no. To me, parent says no, you back off. You're done. We're not talking about this anymore. And that was not what happened. The parents said no. These doctors would push and push and push and push. And every single visit, it would be push some more. And they would talk in the team meetings about how, oh, we just, like, they were just convinced, like, if we could just convince them, if we could just make it happen. And there were also plenty of parents who straight up said to us when they were giving consent, they would say things like, you're going to do this anyway. I don't really have a choice. I feel like I've been bullied. They would straight up tell us this. I feel like I have been bullied into saying yes. And somehow the doctors thought that that was a true good consent. You know, Emily, if I, if I can say something here, yes, what's please. really fascinating to me is that, you know, our organization, we work with parents all over the country, literally almost every state. And what Jamie just described is what we have heard dozens and dozens of times from parents all over, you know, hundreds of miles away, almost the same terminology, would you rather have, if, if, it's, a, if it's a daughter, would you rather have uh, a, a dead daughter or a live son? We, we have actually filed court documents and make briefs on behalf of, and one of them was like uh, 10 or so parents who held this almost the same story. They were, they were, they were said that they were told this with their child in the room. Um, and so I just find it really interesting. How is it, you know, that this, what we're seeing here is this clinic, it's, rep it's reproduced beyond just this one clinic. I, I think that's a very important point that was brought up in the story. Uh, the story mentions about 15 years ago, there were no pediatric gender transition clinics in this country. Now there are uh, conservatively 100, depending on how you count a pediatrician's office that offers the services. There are many hundreds, there are hundreds, many hundreds of 
places that are providing care to transition minors. And many um, listeners right now have written in to say, okay, you've explained the parents are bullied into this and they're terrified they're the, the doctors tell them your child is going to commit suicide. Um, we know that the suicide risk is far, far, far lower than the than that they parents are we, told. We also know it's 2023 though, and from a mental health care perspective, we actually have a lot of really good interventions for suicidal ideations that are not hormones that could also be tried. Yes. Okay. Very good point. Their question is, uh, as you say, Bernadette, you have clients all over the country. What's in the head of these doctors? Do uh, Is it financial? Is it ideological? Why would you want to turn a unhappy uh, teenage girl who may be going through some bad times into a, try to turn her into a boy as a solution to these problems, which have to be dealt with separately or maybe passing. And, and let's just, just say what, when we talked about uh, what happens when you put a girl on testosterone, we're sterilizing these young people. We are. And, and and we're actually, and Jamie, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't believe I am it's actually offering them a completely false hope because a female can never become a male, just never, right? So are we putting these kids on the path to a conflict with their developing bodies that they that will just never be resolved, right? Because these are lifetime dis- decisions. Life-altering decisions. They, they, but they also never got a chance, some of them, to even try to understand what being a girl or being a woman is. So most of these kids have never been in any sort of physical sexual relationship. They are really naive to even what what it means to be a woman in in 2023. So what, uh, again, so many questions from listeners are the doctors, is this a money making thing for them? Are they blind to the harms they're doing? So I have always struggled with the money piece because I, it's not like we were getting bonuses because you had a 10,000 times the number of patients that you thought you were going to have when we opened the center. I never saw it like that. Um, I do believe that we were one of the elements within these divisions that was at least breaking even and we weren't the ones losing a bunch of money because I do think that some divisions, it costs more to provide care to kids than they make. Um, I don't know that it was about the money. I think that it is, I think that it's this very difficult mixture of Maybe belief at the beginning, maybe belief that, you know, I think there are some people who believed that the Dutch study made sense at the beginning. And then. This is briefly a a study from many years ago saying children uh, who are distressed with their gender, who transition, um, uh, adjust very well and have a good outcome. This study has recently been. Uh, debunked quite thoroughly, but um, in any case, you think some of the physicians were thinking we have good evidence for doing this? Yes, yes. They they would they would state that they have that they believe they have good evidence, and then they would also focus on the you know maybe the few patients that they feel like they had seen good outcomes on, but because no one <laughs> there was no data actually being collected and no actual statistical view you can't actually make those claims. Well, and I'm not, I want, I want to, I don't want to pause it at a possibility here. Um, again, with the whistleblower in England talked about 
observing ideological capture of the medical community. And, and I, you know, I would like to throw out to Jamie, do you, did you, did you believe that you're beginning to observe an ideological capture of sort of a belief that, that, you know, ideologically, that this is just what they need to do, regardless of the evidence, regardless of the observation, regardless of what's actually happening to the, to the patients. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if that was in play. I think it explains some of what we would see because we would talk to the doctors. We we pushed and asked and talked and tried to open up the dialogue about about some of these cases, but also the this is you and and one other staff member who right. And we would ask and push and ask and push, and then we would be told, "Well, you have to show us specific cases," and then we would show them specific cases and within our own center and. It was just so, it, it is, it's like, it, I don't want to make light of it, but it did begin to feel like I was in a cult and had to like deprogram my way out of it. Wow. And there oh, are still but- moments that I, there's still moments that I see in the Q and A where people are kind of ch- almost kind of saying to me, why are you using they, them pronouns? And why are you saying these things? Because when, because it it does have these elements of the language, you have to use the right language. You can't, you, it, there's all these elements that are very cult-like. Let me take a question from um, listener, Olivia Kay. I'm a teacher and we are dealing with being compelled and coerced to have policies that facilitate social transition. This is um, before hor- hormones or surgery, you would change your hair, your name, your clothes, it, Uh, kids would change that at school. Most recently, an act passed in my state requiring pads and tampons in the boys' bathroom. My question is, what harms are associated with facilitating social transition? And let me just say from um, having worked on some other stories about this, you know, it's often said there's, so that's a good thing to do, to have um, it, sometimes it's done without parents' knowledge. Your child goes to school and has a completely different identity, but there's a lot of evidence that that sets you on a path that the child can't get off of, even if the child has doubts. So what do you to think, and this may be something, Bernadette, you're dealing with, with boys' bathrooms have to have uh, pads and tampons for the transgender kids who are coming in? Well, well, I can talk about the social Mm -hmm. aspect of transition. Um, We had cases of kids who had socially transitioned who talked about how it was hard for them to even back out of that. Because once you create this worldview and your parents buy in and then they go and tell the grandparents and then they go to the school, it is... It is so hard for kids to be able to actually do what I think is normative, which is gender exploration, when you're doing it within this setting where you're socially transitioning. So I'm all for, I have five boys. If you want to paint your toenails, I don't care. I don't have any fingernail polish myself in the house, but you know, if you want to paint your toenails, I'm not, I don't think that this is life or death. But for a kid, once you publicly declare and you change name and you change pronouns and you change all of these elements, they really get trapped. And once they're trapped, then they not only don't see a way out, but I've heard kids talk about that they would be letting their families down. They would be letting their parents down. And so I don't see social transition as a as something that doesn't have elements of harm to it. It's it's not, it is not a neutral intervention. No, it is not it, neutral. It just isn't. I and think this is a very important point that people don't understand. The, very, the, kids, the kids have said that. We once that happened, they could not back out. And we have to keep in mind. And okay, so what Jamie was observing in her clinic is what we've been hearing from around the country. That almost every last one of these these patients, these kids had really significant mental health comorbidities, all right? Trauma, autism spectrum, DID, OCD, eating disorders. I mean, the list is goes. And so 
these are vulnerable kids to begin with. And so the investment that they were that they were making in believing that my distress or whatever other mental health you know, issue that they were facing with, this is my ticket to feeling normal. This is my ticket to acceptance of, you know, many times they were often struggling as well as socially in school, because people with other with mental health comorbidities have a lot of vulnerabilities. And so when you're offering this, this, it is a mental health intervention, this it social is. transitioning to them. <coughs> there's, there's a latching onto it. And so it's not at all neutral. And let me, if I could just say something about the schools. Um, oh my God, we have three lawsuits right now. We're not going to get into that, but it is in school systems all around the country where, where school officials, teachers are somehow believing that they have the authority to take the place of parents in making these very, these life altering mental health decision, whether to endorse their, their child's assumed identity and engage in this, in this, um, this mental health intervention and cut the parents out. And there's, there's reasons for that. We could talk about another interview because of a distortion of title nine, that is absolutely a distortion, but what they're doing is that, but they need to understand the teacher that, that wrote in, it is harming the child. Anytime you drive a wedge between a child and their loving parent, you are harming that child because you're harming the whole family unit. And you and, and where are you going to be five years down the road, 10 years down the road, when that child has major, major problems and you're long gone, you've gone on to the next student years ago. So this is really, this has got to stop. Uh, Carol from Indianapolis has written in, and several people have written similarly. Um, you, you mentioned, Jamie, in England uh, that the gender dysphoria and, um, transgen and transgender clinics popped up all over the Western world. Um, but in England, the one big gender clinic has been shut down because of the kind of uh, practices that Jamie, you blew the whistle on inadequate vetting of children, damaging treatment, uh, ignoring comorbidities. So uh, England has put a moratorium on it. Sweden has essentially put a moratorium. Finland, other countries are uh, who are peer nations to us are saying, you know, I think we're making a mistake and we're going to stop. Why is the United States such an outlier? Uh, are you in touch with uh, people in other countries about how we may, how we can get what's happening there happening here? So we have a very different medical system here, though. Our system is not set up in the way that many of those countries are. And so the way that this is going to have to work out here in the United States is going to be a very different, it's, it's going to have to play out in a different way. Um, the one thing I will say about those countries, though, is that there is a common denominator, and that is the importance of the desisters and the detransitioners. And I don't think anything that happened in England would be anywhere near it. What's going on now? If it not or not for Kira Bell and some right, of these, let me just Kira Bell is a detransitioner is someone who has transitioned to the opposite sex and said this is was a mistake. I'm going back to my birth sex, um, and a desister is someone who starts on the path to transition and stops it. Kira Bell was a British transitioner who. Uh, was part of a legal action against the clinic that transitioned her. And I, I think that might be what is going to happen here is that we're going to, we need to listen to the D transitioners. And that was one of the things I really wanted our clinic to do. And I thought it was something that medicine as a whole wanted to do. You would want to look and see when when you provided an intervention and then the patient said it didn't work out for me and it failed you're supposed to investigate and figure out why. We have, um, we've had several questions from listeners saying, 
Well, how do you um, identify the kids who truly have gender dysphoria and need to transition from the ones who don't? And uh, so I, I know, Jamie, in the piece you said, you are against youth transition. Can you elaborate on that? And what about the people who say, look, kids are in the middle of this transition. It's what they want. And they are truly transgender. It's not kids with just experiencing social contagion. I, I think this is this is potentially out of my, it's almost out of my scope. So mm -hmm. I have a master's degree in clinical research management. And the one thing I can say from my scope is that in clinical research and research that we do, there are different levels of research before you roll it out to human research studies. And there are things that you have to do first before you try it in humans. And just knowing what I know about clinical research, I think that we need a moratorium and we need to go back to square one. And square one in drug studies is in animals. But um, I think we need to go all the way back to research at square one before we move back into anything to do with children, humans. We're, we're not there yet. And you know, uh, and go ahead. Yeah, also. So legally, we've, we have learned through the Nuremberg trials of what, 60 or so years ago. After um, World War II. After World War II, right. There were certain protections that were put in place for patients, particularly in the, to, to, for human patients in the context of research and experimental drugs. And anytime you have something that is being done in a, on an experimental basis. And these treatments, there's no question about it. They are experimental. There is not a single controlled clinical study that, that supports their efficacy and, and safety that has established it at, from, to, a, to a medical standard. So they are clearly experimental, but under under long established law and 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 precedent there are protections that are afforded to patients in in studies and in and in, and in experimental contexts and none of these are were being in, uh, utilized or being afforded to patients at, in this in this center and quite frankly in general around the country and that's part of that's part of the concern in all of this is we're subjecting our kids to, to a level of, of recklessness, medical recklessness, without any of the attendant safeguards that are, are normally uh, utilized for bringing a drug you know, it, into the mainstream of common usage. And these are kids whose bodies are still developing. We have no idea the long-term impacts of what we're going to see. Are we going to have all kinds of strange cancers? Like we know that we, it, it, it seems to cut their lives short from what little we do know. So there's, 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 there are tremendous ethical um, conundrums here that have to be resolved before we could continue to, we, we should be continuing to do this as, as normative. The other thing about the, about the 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 person asking the question, there is no objective medical test for who is going to desist and who is not. So that's part of you're 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 giving kids treatments that are irreversible. They have the irreversible effects on their bodies, and yet you don't you do not have an objective assay test that you can give to say up. Oh, Okay, this one yes, and this one no. That that's very troubling. That should be very troubling to all of us. I have a question here from a sixteen-year-old girl. Uh, hi, Georgia. She says, "I'm a sixteen-year-old girl living in Portland, Oregon, an extremely liberal city. How do I fight for these children and not be completely destroyed while doing so?" And what she's talking about is the 
just the hostility. Um, the, the hostility is probably a mild word to describe what you get when you raise questions uh, about transitioning children. I'm so but, excited by this question. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, I, I I think adolescents are awesome. Um, so, Georgia, you remind me of myself at 16. Oh, um, I I think first of all, you're going to find um, that there are way more people that will support you. Um, they are there. They are um, oftentimes just waiting for one other person to speak up. And then once you do, then um, they're like, oh, wait, I, 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 I'm on, I'm, I got your back here. Um, but I just think it's so cool that you're even um, on, a, on a platform like this on a school night and um, do the research. Um, there's a ton of data out there. There's awesome books and great podcasts and just, um, just keep up learning and being curious about the world and wanting to take a stand about things. Cause I think that's amazing. And Georgia, I would, I would also say this is Jamie is a perfect example of what it is, what's, what's possible because the vast majority of people recognize there's, there's something amiss here. There's just something that's just not right. But so many people feel in, intimidated and inhibited to they don't know what to do. They're, they're, they're afraid of what to say, but when one person steps forward, like Jamie does, it disinhibits others from saying that, which has been, you know, on their heart for, for some time. Right. And so, you know, thank you, Jamie, that you you're doing this for others. Right. But you, Georgia, you can be, you know, a Jamie in, in Oregon. And, and, and I would say, you know, really truly follow you know, Miss Reed's example, because she does it with such compassion. I mean, if there's anything that comes across from, from Jamie is, is that it's clear to me that she is compelled by compassion. And, and when you are, it's very hard to, for someone on the other side to comfortably be able to attack that. And you, and you, you'll win over a lot of people. And then just a lot of other people who have been waiting for someone else to say something that they can say, oh, I finally can say something as well. So be encouraged. I think that's an amazing note to close on because uh, I wanted to talk about where the courage comes to stand up and do something like you've done, Jamie. And that was a great explanation and encouragement for other people from uh, both of you. So, um, Thank you so much to the 800 people who joined us and asked hundreds of questions. We could only get to a few this evening. I'm sorry. Thank you, Jamie and Bernadette, for uh, your wisdom and your courage. We really appreciate you coming on to talk more about this uh, amazing story, which has had an explosive response. And there's going to be another FP forum next Wednesday. Keep your eye out for that. We'll have an announcement tomorrow. And thank you so much to my guests here and everyone who joined us. And good night. Thank, thank you. you so much.